Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 622 for the 13th of September 2020. <laughs> Richard Saunders coming to you from Sydney, Australia. I'm in Yo Park. It's a nice big park not too far from the Skeptic Zone studios on a nice Sunday morning. And somebody has obviously bought a new toy of a giant remote controlled four wheel drive and they're zooming it all around the park. You might be able to hear it in the background. I've uh, had the habit over the last four or five months of this pandemic to make sure I regularly exercise with very long walks and it does me a world of good, it really does. So I'm sitting out here in the semi-nature with a remote controlled car zipping around. There it is, zooming over there. But I think you can also hear the birds in the trees chirping away and some cars. Oh, there's a bird right now, just flew above me going away now. Exciting, isn't it? And the weather report, of course, you love to hear the weather report from Sydney, Australia. It's uh, slightly overcast, but quite pleasant. Now those birds you can hear are rainbow lorikeets. Very colorful parrots. Now, I suppose you want to know what's coming up this week on the Skeptic Zone podcast. We're going to dive once more into the treasure trove that is Trove the online resource from the National Library of Australia. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were looking for clairvoyance through history, as reported in various magazines and periodicals. This week, we're going to be looking for yowie hunts. Those times in the recent past where people have set off into the Australian outback or the bush or the uh, forest, the wilderness, to search for the Australian Bigfoot known as the Yowie. It's something I certainly remember when I was a little kid. People going out hunting for Yowies, and they still do, believe it or not. After that, we catch up with some news from the Centre for Inquiry. You may remember earlier this year they were taking Walmart and some other companies to court uh, about selling homeopathy on their shelves. We get an update from that, and it's not all smooth sailing so far. Then we have a report from the Skeptrack Live, which was just last weekend. Find out what that was all about and how it went. And after that, a very strange um, case indeed, where a friend of mine takes Henrietta the cat to a vet. Well, not any vet. A new age vet. Yes, in fact, Henrietta, ooh, about a week or so ago managed to scratch her face and so my wonderful friend Dr. Angie Matke volunteered to take Henrietta to get some treatment so find out how that turned out later on in the show then we round off this week's show with the latest news letter from the Australian skeptics what skeptical news has caught the eye of Tim Mendham this week more birds well, I hope you find this episode of The Skeptic Zone to be marvellous, inspirational, and beneficial. But now it's time for me to amble over to the cafe, get some breakfast, and while I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. weeks ago on the Skeptic Zone, we took a trip into Trove. We dove into the Trove. Dove, dived. Trove is an online resource by the Australian government at trove.nla.gov.au. It's an amazing collection of digitised newspapers, periodicals, magazines, that sort of thing, 
searchable going back decades into centuries. Now before, we were looking at uh, what came up when we put in the word clairvoyant. Well, this week I thought I'd try the same thing again, except I put in the words yowie hunt. Now, for those of you who may not know, a yowie, in the modern sense, is more or less a Bigfoot. Yes, even here in Australia, people think that creatures like the Bigfoot are running around to this day. Now, I first remember hearing about yowies in the 1970s when I also heard about Bigfoot. So I've long suspected that people here in Australia just got jealous and decided that we needed our own biped, giant biped, hence Yowie fever. And indeed, Yowie fever is used in the first article I've found. And this comes from the Canberra Times, published on the 12th of October 1976. Yes, and that more or less lines up with my memories of Yowies from the 1970s, around 1976. Queen Bean goes ape on Yowie. And Queen Bean is just near Canberra. Yowie fever has come to the district since the board of directors of the Queen Bean City Festival offered $100,000 for the capture of the Australian man-like ape said to have been seen in the Monaro region. A television crew has arrived from Melbourne. Telephone calls are coming in from people claiming to have seen the creature. And the festival president, Mr Jim Belshaw, is regarding the Yowie idea as anything but abominable. The latest sighting was reported yesterday afternoon by Mr. Barry Costello, a fence builder in the Gugong Dam area, who said he had seen a big, dark, cray creature with a, quote, round head merging into its shoulders, end quote. It was about 180 centimetres tall and, quote, much bigger than any kangaroo, end quote. Radio station 2CA in Canberra has decided to match the $100,000 offer for the capture of the Yowie. And Mr Rex Gilroy, the director of the Mount York National History Museum in the Blue Mountains, was reported to be pushing ahead with plans to head a Yowie hunt. Now, Rex Gilroy is... Uh, very famous in cryptozoology circles here in Australia. He has a huge collection of uh, giant footprints made by yowies and a big collection of giant paw prints made by giant cats. Now we go to the 26th of October, 1976. Canberra Times. Homemade yowie. And there's a picture of a man, a bearded man, standing in front of a giant ape-like creature which is about eight feet tall. Mr. Ken Tabber, an employee of J.B. Young Limited, Queen Bean, and the Yowie, which took him 50 hours to build. The creature is reputed to roam the hills of the Monaro region. Mr. Tabber's one is made of a wood frame, wire, and synthetic fur, and is to be displayed at Young's. The Queen Bean City Festival Committee and 2CA have each offered $100,000 for capture of a real Yowie. Now let's go to the same publication, the Gambra Times, on the 1st of November 1976. So, some weeks later, there's an article here that says, Yowie Hunt Begins. Seven four-wheel drive vehicles led by a former British Army captain, Mr. Doug Williams of Queen Bean, left Queen Bean yesterday on a yowie hunt. The group camped last night and is expected to return today. Late last night, no word has been received whether they had been successful. Now, just a few days later, here we go. We have a report from the 4th of November 1976 from the Canberra Times, Yowie Safari at Weekend. A public hunting safari is being organised to search for the Yowie at the weekend. 
but no guns are allowed. The Queenbean Festival Committee has approached Mr. Jim Brissenden of Captain's Flat to organise the safari with meals, a barbecue and beer supplied at a cost of $15 a head. Oh man, I wish they'd run that today. (laughs) The safari will leave the main road in Captain's Flat about 10am on Saturday and head for the Tinderi Mountains along the Quinbian Ridge. Mr. Brissenden said on Monday that the safari would establish once and for all if there was a yowie around the Quinbian district. Quote, We'll look up creeks, rivers, and in caves along the Tinderi Mountains to see if this yowie is fair dinkum or not, end quote, he said. Persons interested in joining the safari can contact Mr. Brissenden on 366-293. Wow, what a, what a hoot that would have been. What an adventure. But let's skip forward now about three years to 1979, once more from the Canberra Times. And this comes to us from the 15th of October 1979. Yowie pads. Spur on stalking party. Sydney hunters, armed with cameras containing infrared film, plan to stalk the legendary Yowie in the Blue Mountains west of Sydney in the early hours of this morning. They hope to catch the creature, described as half man, half ape, on film. A team led by Chief Yowie Hunter, Mr. Rex Gilroy, was due to set out at 10am and continue in rugged terrain in the Jamison Valley, an area about 15 to 20 kilometres from Katoomba. Their hopes were high after being awakened at their bush camp just after midnight on Saturday. The hunters woke to the sound of rustling leaves and other noises and rushed out with torches, but found nothing. Later in the morning, however, big footprints believed to be those of a yowie were seen leading up a hill. Right, I think we can put two and two together here. Earlier, two footprints were found in a creek bed and Mr. Rex Gilroy has taken plaster casts of them, which he is expecting to bring to Katoomba this morning. The search is being conducted by Penrith radio station 2KA, and has been joined by volunteers from the Army's Air Dispatch Unit at Penrith, undergoing what Private Dave Oliver said was, quote, adventure training, end quote, and research on surveillance in rough country. Oh, Rex Gilroy and his plaster casts. I've seen many of them. They're quite something. Now, speaking of Rex Gilroy, once again, I've come across an article published in the Australian Woman's Weekly, And it comes from December 1976. And I remember, I remember seeing this article in 1976 when my mother used to read uh, this magazine when I was a young boy. So why not read some of this uh, from the uh, Woman's Weekly? It's huge, hairy, and hides in the bush. From Cape York to Tasmania, the monster yowie prowls. Forget the fairies at the bottom of your garden. There may be a yowie lurking there. According to self-appointed yowie expert Rex Gilroy, Australia has a huge and hairy monster roaming the eastern states, and there was a reported sighting in New Guinea too. The yowie is different from Britain's Nessie and the Yeti of the Himalayas because our monster likes the trees and undergrowth of dry, warm land. There has been a boom in sightings of the Yowie in the Queenbean and Hawkesbury areas of New South Wales in the past months. In October, the Queenbean Festival Board put up a $200,000 reward for the capture of a Yowie after a Gugong Dam worker was terrified when confronted by, quote, a dark, grey, hairy creature with its head merging into its shoulders, end quote. It was about 180 centimetres or six feet tall, the worker insisted. In the Hawkesbury River area, a fisherman gave chase after seeing two huge ape-like creatures amble into the bush. He pursued them for some distance, but retreated when they began pelting him with rocks from a high ledge. I was just about to have a little giggle, but the next paragraph begins with, quote, It's no laughing matter, 
end quote, says 32-year-old Rex Gilroy, who lives at Katoomba in the Blue Mountains. He is so concerned at getting to the bottom of the mystery that he set up the first Yowie Research Centre in Australia in July. Rex has been on the trail of the Yowie for the past 10 years. Now the trail has become so hot that he has organised the first Yowie hunt. A search of the Barrington Tops area in the Great Dividing Range will be made soon. Quote, there are enough freshly taken plaster casts of footprints, some Yowie footprints are as large as 60 centimetres, 2 feet long, by 33 centimetres, 14 inches wide, to indicate that we are closing in on him. The search will be a major one and I'll be choosing the party. And quote, Rex says, quote, for instance, I don't want a champion marksman who volunteered. I want the Yowie taken alive for scientific study. The only weapons we'll carry will be cameras and tranquilizer darts. It is sad that whenever some rare creature is spotted, the bush is filled with homicidal madmen armed with guns. End quote. Oh, this is a joy. Rex has a lot of Yowie evidence gathered over the years, such as stone artifacts, too big and cumbersome ever to have been used by man, and monster footprint casts at his Mount York Natural History Museum at Mount Victoria in the Blue Mountains. A self-taught geologist and zoologist, he claims to have the largest privately owned natural history collection in the Southern Hemisphere. He first saw one of the huge footprints when hiking over the Katoomba area of the Blue Mountains. Quote, they were bare prints about two and a half times the normal size, end quote. Then, at 3.30pm on August 7th, 1970, Rex says, quote, I was hiking back from Mount Solitary when I stopped to rest on a rock and eat my sandwiches. This creature jumped up from behind a tree, scurried through the giant ferns and into the rainforest, making a grunting, gurgling sound that changed into a screech once it entered the scrub. It was covered with hair with no facial features and had the long, loping gait of an ape. I thought it was a circus orangutan that had escaped. I shot home and told Dad, he's an old miner, and he said he'd heard of these things being seen before. End quote. Rex took to literature and read Eastern Australian folk tales in which Aborigines described a creature of, quote, the Yowie or Great Hairy Man, end quote. Now, this uh, report goes on for two full pages. It's fascinating stuff, but I will just leave it for you to read the rest if you so wish, apart from this paragraph which has just caught my eye on the page I'm reading. So we read a little bit later on. Eric von Daniken, who wrote Chariots of the Gods, gives Rex a good hearing in his book, in Search of Ancient Gods, and Rex is interviewed in Von Daniken's film, Mysteries of the Gods, which should be released in Australia soon. Quote, He has taken my evidence to support his claims of giants as early inhabitants of Earth. End quote. Anyway, you can read the rest of that article for yourself. I will certainly add a link in this week's show notes to, uh, to Trove and... Uh, how to search for Yowie Hunt. But uh, wow, what an interesting little trip that's been in recent history, more or less, in the last uh, decades, going back to the 1970s. And in fact, Maynard has interviewed Rex Gilroy for The Skeptic Zone in 2014, episode 291. And that's very easy to find. If you go to skepticzone.tv, click the episode link and either do a search or just go uh, via the menu to that episode, episode 291. But there we are. Another interesting dive into the treasure trove that is Trove from the National Library of Australia. Appearing at Skepticon 2020, the Australian Skeptics National Convention, Professor Jonty Horner. 
Jonti first became interested in astronomy after accidentally viewing part of the sky at night when he was five, and has been hooked ever since. Now, he is an astronomer and astrobiologist based at the University of Southern Queensland in Toowoomba. His research focuses on three main fields, the study of the solar system, particularly the small objects therein, such as comets, asteroids and meteors, the search for alien worlds and astrobiology, where he is particularly interested in understanding the coalescence of factors that might place a planet in our line of sight in the search for life beyond our solar system. Professor John T. Horner, just one of the speakers at Skepticon 2020 online. For more information and tickets, visit www.skepticon.org.au. Here's a newsletter that's come into my inbox from the Centre for Inquiry. We're not backing down from Walmart. The next step in our case against Walmart and homeopathy. Snake oil profiteering has emerged as a genuine crisis during the COVID-19 pandemic, exemplifying what we at the Centre for Inquiry have been saying for years. Pseudoscientific medicine is dangerous, and those who profit from it must be held accountable. That's why we launched our groundbreaking consumer protection lawsuit last year against the world's largest retailer, Walmart, for its deceptive sale and marketing of homeopathic health products. Shelving and listing homeopathic medicine alongside real, evidence-based products under signs and online listings reading, quote, cold and flu remedies, end quote, Walmart is deceiving its customers by equating real medical treatments with the fakest of all fake medicines. In May, Walmart convinced a DC Superior Court judge to dismiss our case on two grounds. First, that the CFI lacked standing because we were not a consumer protection organization. Second, that we failed to show the harm of Walmart's deceit. If that sounds ridiculous to you, it should. Homeopathy wastes consumers' money, fails to treat any condition whatsoever, and, in the worst case, can result in sickness or even death. And as for CFI's standing, well, you certainly know better. For more than 40 years, CFI has stood on the side of consumers, fighting for science-based medicine over quack alternatives, combating pseudoscience and misinformation about vaccines and other health issues, and advocating for stricter regulation of homeopathic products. For goodness sake, we're the home of Quackwatch and the Society for Evidence-Based Medicine. This week, the Center for Inquiry submitted its appeal to the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. Leveraging its nearly unlimited financial resources, Walmart will keep trying to skirt the issues but the facts are not so easily dismissed. They deliberately confuse consumers so they can make a profit from selling them fake medicine. We intend to hold them accountable. Help keep up the fight against pseudoscience and snake oil. Support CFI today. And for more information on that story, you can visit centerforinquiry.org. Hi, this is Susan Gerbeck from GSOW. That's Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. I want to thank everyone who, via the Skeptic Zone podcast, has contacted me to become an editor on Wikipedia. Together, we have worked on or created over 1,200 Wikipedia pages. Countless thousands of people all over the world access those pages each day. In fact, we're over 52 million page views. Like many listeners, I also give back to the Skeptic Zone via monthly micropayments. And I want to encourage you to do the same. Is the information and entertainment you get each week from the show worth five or ten dollars a month? I sure think it is. Follow the link at skepticzone.tv and show your practical support. Thank you.
Dragon Con 2020. Now, on last week's show, we more or less devoted the whole episode to promoting the Dragon Con event, Skeptrack in particular. And now it's all over. I'll give you a little report on what I thought about the uh, the weekend from Atlanta. First of all, I want to say it was fabulous. It was so enjoyable. What a top lineup of speakers they had, uh, including such interesting people as uh, Lynn Kelly from Australia. Abhijit Chanda from India gave a talk. We also had a famed uh, investigator of fraud psychics, Bill Nygaard. Leo Igwe made an appearance. Susan Gerbeck from Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. Ben Radford and Celestia Award. And that is just to name but a few now of the interesting talks presented by Skeptrack from Atlanta, Georgia. Now, one of the things that uh, really put the icing on the cake was the amazing technical presentation. So each talk, each interview, was presented as if it was in a, a marvellous studio with our lovely host, uh, Dr. Angie Matke. Or sometimes there was uh, Derek Colin Duno and even Mark Ditzler was uh, in charge of one segment. But it was astonishing to see how slick the production was. There was uh, Angie, for example, in the studio at her desk, and then suddenly a live cross all around the world, to India, to Australia, to various parts in the United States, where the guest would appear on a monitor and uh, enjoy some live interaction. Now, for my part, I appeared here from Sydney, Australia, from the Skeptic Zone Studios, and uh, helped introduce my segment then, played a pre-recorded lecture, and then afterwards I was able to come back live and take uh, questions from the audience from all around the world. That was most enjoyable, and here is a uh, a clip, a segment of uh, one of those questions. Okay. Well, um, Susan Gerbic has asked you to suggest three books for people who uh, to read that are just starting out in skepticism. Something, something. Flim Flam. Flim Flam. Absolutely. James Flim Randi. Flam. Mm-hmm, I have that one. Yeah. The Demon Haunted World. Yep, that's a good one. By Carl Sagan. And a book I've read twice now in the last six months, The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. An excellent primer on skepticism. Oh, well, that sounds good. <laughs> Not just the podcast. The book is... is uh, very good. I mean, as an experienced skeptic of 20 years, listening to this book um, just reinforced a lot of things to me, and I learned a lot of new stuff, and uh, it, it's, yeah, I would absolutely recommend that. And then there's, well, there are many books. The Mask of Nostradamus is a terrific read by James Randi again. Mm-hmm. The Faith Healers mm-hmm. by James Randi is a book that makes you angry, which is which is yeah. excellent. So, yeah, there's a good catalogue of uh, material out there. Now, it's worth mentioning something I heard many years ago, which I think is uh, called the first law of the sea or something like that. Gremlins get into everything. In other words, every now and then there are going to be technical hitches, especially when you think of the complexity of what what they were doing, hooking up to people all around the world, sometimes even on a split screen so they'd have one person from this part of the world, uh, Leo Igwe, for example, another person from another part of the world was... Angie in the studio or hooking up. So naturally, every now and then, something goes slightly amiss with the uh, the technology. But that's just to be expected, and it's perfectly okay. Uh, I think the audience understand. Now, Dr. Angie Mackey, what a wonderful host she was for most of uh, Skeptrack this year. She was uh, enthusiastic, she was funny, and she conducted interviews very well. Never, never seemed flustered by technical errors or anything like that. She just got on with it. Well done, Dr. Angie. Now, you can enjoy these talks, or most of them, I think, if you go to www.skeptrack.com, and that's S-K-E-P-T-R-A-C-K.com, 
and that will give you a redirect directly to the YouTube page of the Skep Track. A big congratulations to Dr. Angie Mackey, Derek Colanduno, and Mark Ditzler from the Calico Cove Studios, who did a superb job this year presenting Skep Track from Dragon Con. But naturally, we hope by this time next year, we we just might be able to enjoy Dragon Con more or less in its uh, traditional format with monsters and Wookiees and creatures from uh, time and space running all around Atlanta, Georgia. Amber Skeptics proudly present Radio Girl, the story of the extraordinary Mrs. Mack, pioneering engineer and wartime legend. This Zoom event will be on the 15th of September, 6pm to 7pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Join Canberra Skeptics as they host a webinar with author David Duffy on his book Radio Girl, the story of the extraordinary Mrs. Mack, pioneering engineer and wartime legend. This book is about Violet McKenzie. As the clouds of war gathered in the 1930s, she defied convention and trained young women in Morse code, foreseeing that their services would soon be sorely needed. Always a champion of women, she was instrumental in getting Australian women into the armed forces. Questions for the webinar can be sent via Zoom, either before or during the event. That's Radio Girl, the story of the extraordinary Mrs. Mack, pioneering engineer and wartime legend. For more information, visit www.cambraskeptics.org. Hello. Hi, good morning. Welcome. Welcome to the Chakra Harmony Universal Medicine Practice, or CHUMP for short. CHUMP? Shh, shh, Henrietta, it's okay, it's okay. Oh yes, oh yes, I saw your online promotion that said that you also cater for animals. Oh yes, in fact all animals, from animal animals to human animals, we use the latest in alternative, alternative medicine including intuitive Roki energy healing. Roki? Don't, don't you mean Reiki? No, no, no. We used to use Reiki, but discovered Roki works even better. It's one of the new alternative, alternative medicines. What, al- alternative, alternative medicines? Yes. We'd like to see ourselves as being in the forefront of the new, new age, and not the new age which is now just the old New Age. So we use the latest in alternative, alternative medicines. Right. Oh dear, what a sweet little cat. Now, what seems to be the problem with her? Oh, it looks like a little scratch on her face got infected. Let me see. Yes. Hmm. Oh, poor little thing. Hmm. There you go. Okay, I think she needs some acupuncture, healing crisp bowls, lomeopathy, chirodractic, reflexmology, and merbel supplements. Um, right? And then she must go on a lemon retox diet. Retox? Retox? I, I was thinking she would need a little antiseptic or something. Oh, you mean anti-skeptic? No, no, no. In fact, we... Hmm. Hmm. The more I look at her, the more I think she may even need alternative, alternative, alternative medicine. Yes. Some flacumuncher, mealing blistles, flomeopathy, scarozaptic, tree lexmology, and merbel supplements. Trelexmology? 
Merble supplements? Th- this is getting ridiculous. Is there someone else here that could give me a second opinion? A second opinion? Well, yes. Uh, Dr. Pontus, have you got a moment? Uh, yeah, sure. I can finish typing this letter later. He's from Sweden, you know. Oh, Sweden? Ooh. Ah, now, Dr. Pontus, have a look at this cat. What would you recommend for that scratch on her face? Yeah, let me see. Hmm. Ah, yeah, that, that's tricky. Uh, that infection could spread. Uh, I think we need to use alternative, 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 alternative medicine. I hate to ask, but... Yeah, I'd recommend Mapulancher. Caring blisters, flomeopathy, skyroblaptic, free textology, and snowball supplements. You see? Now, we could ask our other colleague what they th- No! No! Enough already! Mapuluncher? Mapuluncher? What, what the hell is that? That's when you get to find some lunch with a map while your cat is treated. Oh, you do? Can I find some wine as well? Oh, Yes, you can. But that is only if you use alternative, 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 alternative medicine. Okay, and that is? Flap you cruncher, bee sting mistles, stone meology, lyrocractic, free sexology, and nibble flupplements, and wine. How much is all of this? 1,965 Swedish Kona. Ooh, do I get to have lunch with you? Sure. Ooh, sign me up. Skeptics Cafe, online from Victoria, Australia. No matter where you are in the world, Join us on the 21st of September, 2020, for a live online talk. Richard Saunders presents Highlights and Lowlights of 20 Years of Skeptical Investigations. Richard will take you on a journey covering 20 years of skeptical work and adventures. What was found at the haunted school? What did the water diviners of Victoria say after attempting to win the Australian Skeptics $100,000 prize? How did an afternoon in Adelaide lead to the downfall of a multi-million dollar company in California? Why did Saunders sleep under a table in Las Vegas? How did a TV news show stitch up the Skeptics? And much more. Join us via Zoom. 8pm for a chat, and then the talk begins at 8.30pm, AEST time. That's 11am on the 21st UK time, 3am on the 21st West Coast USA, and 6am on the 21st East Coast USA. For more information and the Zoom link, just head to www.facebook.com slash the Skeptics Cafe, or check out the show notes in this week's episode of the Skeptic Zone podcast. See you there. Time to peer once again into our inboxes. What do we find? The Australian Skeptics Newsletter, number 106. And this comes to us from none other than Tim Mendham, who you hear from time to time on the Skeptic Zone with his segment, The Book of Tim. And I think Tim will be visiting the studio soon to record a batch more of those interesting articles. Items in the newsletter. Skepticon tickets, get them now. I did. Oh yes, I bought my early bird ticket just a couple of days ago. Skepticon 2020 is approaching rapidly. And while it is an online event, 
you won't be able to view the presentations without purchasing a ticket. Well, that's pretty fair enough. The October 24th to the 25th event will be streamed live on a closed YouTube channel. You will be provided with the details on how to access the live stream via email after you purchase your tickets. And the early bird tickets will cease being sold after September the 24th, a couple of weeks away. So now is the time to go to www.skepticon.org.au and get your cheaper tickets. And don't forget, if you're going to join us, especially from the United States, with the, uh, the dollar conversion at the moment, you save a bundle, sort of a saving on a saving. The next news item says chiropractors ignore board advice. The Chiropractic Board of Australia, CBA, has proved to be a failure in ensuring its members follow its own advice. In a statement made in March 2016, the CBA made the following advice on use of antenatal treatments, largely Webster technique. Chiropractors are not trained to apply any direct treatment to an unborn child and should not deliver any treatment to the unborn child. Chiropractic care must not be represented or provided as treatment to the unborn child as an obstetric breach correction technique. However, a random survey of chiropractors' websites by skeptical activists has shown that a high percentage of chiropractors are still doing this. In 2016, shortly after the statement was made, skeptics alerted the CBA to 140 websites that promoted Webster technique. They repeated the alert in 2017 and 2019. In May this year, a further review was made revealing that 45 of the original 140 are still promoting their treatment of antenatal babies. According to the CBA, there are currently 5,777 chiropractors registered in Australia. If a random survey is any indication, there could be close to 2,000 chiropractors ignoring the advice. The CBA has been asked for comment. Next item says, Pete Evans, remember celebrity chef Pete Evans, Pete Evans joins off-grid community in northern New South Wales. The increasingly strange Paleo Pete is promoting the nightcap on Minjumbul Alternative Sanctuary at Mount Burrell near Nimbin, a hotspot for anti-vaxxers. It's very tribal and new age-ish. The last time this sort of thing was tried on the same site, it fell apart in recrimination and court action. Now just a little note for me, for those people internationally, Nimbin, well especially when I was growing up in the 70s and the 80s, Nimbin was just considered to be hippie central Australia alternative lifestyles and views and things like that. The next item says Africa declared free of polio. And don't forget these items are actually links so you can read more information for yourself when you get the newsletter. Now it says it takes four years of no cases for an area to be declared polio free. Following a vaccination drive in Nigeria Africa has achieved that status. Need any more examples of how vaccination works? Here's another item. Banned naturopath still spreading the word. Naturopath Barbara O'Neill, who has a lifetime prohibition order against her from the New South Wales Health Care Complaints Commission, is apparently giving lectures to a health retreat in Alabama. The week's long events are being held via Zoom, so the question is, is she breaking the order by doing it? Presumably from New South Wales. And here's another one. Pseudoscientific therapy is actually backed by science. How can they be pseudoscience if they're backed by science? Now that would make them science, wouldn't it? This article looks at a few alt-med practices that might actually work. Its heart is in the right place, ending with... If you dig deep enough, you can probably find evidence to support just about any claim. But the quality of that evidence is what matters. As this claim stood up to the scientific method, is it widely accepted in the scientific community? 
How trustworthy are these sources making the claim? Answers to these questions can help anyone draw the line between pseudoscience and science. We applaud the review of all practices, but it is a hard slog getting off the shaky ground where most alt-med practices lie. Now, there are many more items and links in the newsletter, and it uh, also mentions some upcoming events. Many skeptics groups are running their regular skeptics in the pub get-togethers online. Some talks, but you must bring your own beer. Check your local guides to see when such activities are on and when normal service may recommence. Normal service will be resumed as soon as possible, we all hope. For example, on September the 15th, the Canberra Skeptics are hosting Radio Girl, the story of the extraordinary Violet McKenzie. On September the 16th, we have Perth Skeptics in the Pub, a skeptic's guide to spotting logical fallacies. And 21st of September, Vic Skeptics Cafe, Richard Saunders. Hmm. Highlights and lowlights of 20 years of skeptical investigation. Hmm. I think I'll go and see that one. And on the 1st of October, Sydney Skeptics in the Pub are very pleased to host Ben Radford, the famed investigator of all things strange. Now it says, if you have any ideas for stories or want to contribute to skeptical communications, such as the magazine or Facebook page, or just have something you want to get off your chest, then you're welcome to get in touch. News leads should be sent to news tips at skeptics.com.au and submissions to the magazine, the Journal of the Skeptics, should go to editor at skeptics.com.au. So those people, especially listening in Australia, if you uh, have an idea for a report, book review, possibly uh, a news item, anything to do with the paranormal, pseudoscience, alternative medicine, that sort of stuff, why not get in touch with Tim Mendham, the editor of the magazine, and who knows, you could well end up in print. There are more items here, one about the flat earth, and one about, uh, what's this? Home exorcists to help sell your haunted house. <laughs> Lots to read in the Australian Skeptics newsletter, and you can have that delivered uh, every couple of weeks into your inbox. Just go to www.skeptics.com.au and you can sign up right there. Allora ciao, io mi chiamo Professore Dave, io ti voglio insegnare tutte le cose sulla scienza. Parliamo di fisica, di chimica, biologia, astronomia, matematica e tante altre cose. Guardami su YouTube, arrivederci! Hey everyone, this is Professor Dave. I want to teach you about all kinds of things regarding science. I want to tell you about physics. I want to tell you about chemistry, biology, astronomy, math, and many, many more things. Come check me out on YouTube. The channel is called Professor Dave Explains. Take it easy. He knows a lot about the science stuff. Professor Dave Explains. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. I'm still here in the park enjoying the nice early morning uh, day here. Let's see, where are those birds gone? They'll probably be back. That guy with his remote control car, where's he? Oh, he's right over the other end of the park. He's probably chasing it, I think. Thank you to those people. Oh, and thank you to those birds just flying overhead. Wow. Another bird. There's a crow. More lorikeets. Thank you to those birds and people who continue to uh, support the Skeptic Zone at www.skepticzone.tv. Without your ongoing support, there would be no Skeptic Zone. As simple as that. And I appreciate everybody who does support. Oh, I think the car's coming. The remote control car might be coming back this way. And just in the last few days, uh, apart from the Australian Skeptics newsletter arriving in my inbox was the uh, electronic version of The Skeptic, the journal from Australian Skeptics. And there's an article uh, by me, apart from other articles, 
uh, concentrating on the uh, Corona Cloud uh, upload service. And this is something we've spoken about before on the show. If you go to the show notes, you can see how you can upload your own uh, Corona conspiracy finds. If you find something shady or wonky about claims of uh, coronavirus and magical health cures, you can upload that to an uh, online resource. And uh, I think in the future that might prove to be very beneficial. You can check that out at skepticzone.tv in the show notes. And just to remind you once again, not too long now before the early bird tickets for the Australian Skeptics Convention, Skepticon 2020, expire, then you'll have to pay a bit more. So if you're going to go, by that I mean watch online, <laughs> now's the time to, uh, to buy your tickets. Hello, what's that? A jet. Wow. They're not very common these days. They're not very common these days, but there you go, a jet flying over. I wonder where that's going to. And there's a corgi right down the hill. Wow, well, it's all excitement in this park, folks. But for this week, with the nature and crazy things happening all around me, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Yo Park, not far from the Skeptic Zone Studios, Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisation. Music